<clears throat> All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, we just have a couple announcements before today's session. Make sure to join our email listserv, uh, which we give out our newsletter with notes about the speakers and also future events. Make sure to follow us on Instagram for full updates regarding all future events. Uh, follow us on LinkedIn and make sure to list us as one of your experiences. Uh, just a reminder, we also increased the window to 48 hours because we know how busy you guys are with online classes and everything like that. So make sure you take full advantage of that. Um, we have all the links associated with everything I just said in our Instagram bio and our link tree. So make sure to check that out. And without further ado, we would like to introduce Dr. Thom. She's an infectious disease physician who primarily works in epidemiology and public health. She's also the Associated Dean for Student Affairs at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Uh, she's very active in clinical research uh, with a specialty in epidemiology. Um, she went to the University of Florida Medical School and completed her residency at the University of Maryland Medical Center. We're super excited um, with the great insight that she's gonna share with us today. Uh, not only with her path to medicine, but also um, information on public health and epidemiology. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Thumb, you can take it away. Great. Thank you so much. Um, it's exciting to be here and talk to folks who are interesting and in embarking in a career in medicine at a time like now. Always interested to talk to folks who are interested in medicine. Um, so yeah, as mentioned, I am an infectious disease physician. I also have some experience um, and interest in healthcare epidemiology and patient safety public health. Um, I'll just start, uh, I don't have any slides about my background, but I will spend a, a decent chunk of time just talking about how I got to where I am today um, and the various paths I've, I've crossed. And one thing I'll start out by saying, which is a common theme I'm, I'm sure you'll hear a lot if you ask a lot of people about their paths to their current job, is, you know, on one hand, I think I have record going as far back into my elementary school yearbooks to, to indicate that I always wanted to be a physician, you know, little notes from teachers saying, good luck on your future career as a doctor. Um, and at the same time, though, if you had told me the way I'm practicing medicine now, I would have never guessed. Um, I would have never guessed I would have been an infectious disease doctor. Um, I would have never guessed I'd be so involved in a global pandemic. I guess who would know that? Um, and I would have never guessed uh, just the specifics that my career has taken, whether it's in education or epidemiology. Um, I, I was though, like I said, always interested in a career in medicine that, that stemmed from a very young age um, with an interest in science and a background of my mom uh, being a nurse's aide. So going in to see her take care of patients at work. Um, and uh, throughout high school and college, I really um, validated that decision, uh, as you guys probably are, through a series of experiences, both um, academically uh, investigating the biological sciences a bit more, but also um, importantly, working with patients and physicians and really getting a sense of what building that doctor-patient relationship is like and how I can best serve um, my community through work as, an, as a physician. Um, and kind of all along that course, I had always had maybe what I would refer to as a layman's interest in infectious disease. You know, before I went to medical school, you could find me reading books like The Outbreak and The Coming Plague. Um, I was very interested in um, careers like Paul Farmer, of people who uh, really invested in communities, um, whether they're local or globally, um, and treating um, infections on a global scale was something that was uh, always interesting and intriguing to me. And perhaps, you know, it was some of that that drove me ultimately to end up in internal medicine and infectious disease. Um, but really, I, I also think I came to the decision to be an internal medicine physician fairly honestly. And if you guys don't know, because sometimes this is, is a bit mystifying, 
Um, when you were in your third year-ish of medical school, you rotate systematically through each of the major specialties, right? OBGYN, internal medicine, pediatrics, um, getting a taste of surgery, what it's like to be an outpatient physician, an inpatient physician. And I approached that with a really open mind and tried to look of where, where is the best fit for me? And I was fortunate to be one of those people who really loved everything I was exposed to. Um, and yet at the same time, I think there were things I was, I was able to um, gravitate toward and things I was able to roll out. And what really pulled me into internal medicine was um, an interest in caring for the adult patient, um, an interest in having the ability to work with um, patients who are at their most vulnerable in the hospital um, during both acute and chronic illnesses, um, in ability to work in teams. All of medicine is, um, has a team-based approach, but internal medicine is a like-minded group of folks like myself who is really interested in talking about complex problems and trying to solve them as part of a team. Uh, and those things drove me toward internal medicine. And then from there, once you pick your general specialty, um, you can start to think about subspecialties, like do, am I mostly interested in infectious disease, which is the area I went to, um, or am I mostly interested in renal or kidney pathology or um, you know, diabetic care, et cetera. Um, and that decision was a little bit easier for me, maybe because of my history of, of being interested in, in infection. Um, and I think I had considered myself lucky. Certainly my classmates thought I was lucky that, that deciding on internal medicine, deciding on infectious disease was fairly easy. And then one day in the middle of my fellowship, it hit me that despite the fact that these decisions were easy, I now had to decide what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And I was not at all prepared for that. Um, in reality, you know, I had a, you know, despite all of my preparation, I had a somewhat narrow vision of each of the next steps. And all of a sudden I started to realize that with a medical degree, um, really no matter what specialty you go into, but certainly in infectious disease, there are so many avenues open to you. Um, primary care physician treating patients in HIV um, in an outpatient setting. Um, academic versus community, um, primarily seeing patients in consultation, uh, how you may want to incorporate research into your career. I had um, co-students, uh, co-residents, co-fellows who went on to careers in public health at a local public health department, who worked for the CDC, um, who worked for drug companies and drug development of antibiotics. Uh, or antiviral medications, who work at the level of the FDA to approve those medications. Um, so there's just an endless, um, an endless opportunity of, of different career paths. And it hit me fairly late that I actually had to pick one. Um, and um, one thing I had known at the time was I really, really liked being in the academic medical center. I loved being around other people who were passionate about learning and exploring and just being that lifelong learner that a physician is. And I also really loved being around people who wanted to learn um, and absorb knowledge and, and to have that opportunity as I grew in my career to educate and mentor. Um, and I also knew that as part of being in an academic medical center, um, there are multiple components of your job, um, and for each person it varies a little bit, but you know, as a physician, you are obviously taking care of patients. Um, you are being involved in education um, and mentorship, and there's also a scholarly component like research. Um, and so at that time, um, when I had decided to give academic medicine a try, I had never done any research before, um, but thought, well, I should probably figure that out so that I had a sense of, um, is academic medicine for me? And in order to do that, I kind of had to pick an area. 
Um, and it may sound like somewhat of a backward approach, but I actually think it was very wise in retrospect, if I can call myself wise. I um, loved everything about infectious disease. I loved every topic you could conceive of, um, whether it was HIV, tuberculosis, whether it was hospital acquired infections, um, anything you could imagine I was interested in. Um, so rather than pick a narrow field to study, I decided that I was going to interview faculty and see who might be a best fit for me as a mentor. Um, and through that process, I met with lots of exciting people and learned about lots of career paths in um, global medicine, in immunology, in um, cancer medicine, and, uh, and um, infectious diseases in the immune suppressed. Um, and I also met with my future mentor, um, who was also an epidemiologist and studied the transmission of bacterial diseases or bacterial infections in the hospital and how to prevent them. And um, I saw that person as someone I really connected with, someone who I saw had amazing experience at mentoring other people and advancing their career. And ultimately we settled on um, a mentee mentor relationship together. And um, I think that's probably one of the smartest decisions I had ever made was really finding that strong connection. Um, through that, I uh, ended up getting a master's in epidemiology. And I still had this sense that I kind of needed to figure out where um, I was going with my career and, and how I was going to um, select a research topic. And it was really important for me that that research topic be um, invested in part of um, how I care for patients. I wanted uh, to take the challenging problems that I'm seeing in the hospital and with the patient population that I serve and be able to solve some of those problems through academic and scholarly pursuit and research. And one thing that was happening at the time of my fellowship was um, during my the latter stages of my infectious disease training, we had an emergence in this country, and in fact, in multiple countries, of a particular bacteria called Acinetobacter that was causing serious infections in um, the military population, and um, interestingly, folks who were in the military and suffered wounds in the field, um, as well as um, the severely chronically ill and hospitalized population. So people who maybe have been uh, need, requiring breathing support through mechanical ventilation, for example, for long periods of time, or residing in long-term care facilities. And this outbreak spread in pockets. Um, it spread um, in, uh, in the Middle East um, through Israel and beyond. It spread in the US and starting in New York and kind of went up and down the East Coast. And we were just starting to see it in Baltimore. And um, at the time, it went from being a pathogen that um, you know, in a text, we had a, we had a textbook that was two volumes. So each volume was about this thick of different infectious diseases. And the line on this organism um, was less than a paragraph. And it was just like this organism we don't see very often, but it can cause wound infections. Um, it went from that to being something that um, became so prevalent in our, um, in our patient population at Maryland that um, it closed down whole units um, to try to stop the spread. Um, and at some point we stopped um, doing surgical procedures because we were trying to figure out how it was spreading in the surgical patient population and had to um, revamp that whole area to make sure that we, um, um, we could safely care for our patients without uh, the risk of getting infection. And you can imagine shutting down operation. We're seeing the effects of that now in COVID, but that was something that we, you know, was, it, it takes a lot to shut down um, the operations of keeping people healthy and safe. And um, 
<clears throat> so there was so much to learn about that organism and it was having such a major impact. And one of the other unique things about that particular bacterium was that um, while we have so many antibiotics at our arsenal, we had um, very few antibiotics available to treat this. It was a um, classic multi-drug resistant organism. And in fact, we dug back into our arsenal into the 50s and 60s and took an antibiotic that we um, hadn't used in decades because of its toxicity and started to use it in this patient population because we didn't have other um, antibiotics at our ready. Um, and so with that, um, you know, I think I was, I saw that as a, a clear opportunity of a gap in our knowledge and something that was really affecting our patients in the way that we could practice care. Um, and that is really what kind of sparked my research career, which sparked my um, administration career in healthcare epidemiology and patient safety. Um, and it's one of the things, you know, that, that sort of story is one of the things that I really have always liked about infectious disease. I mean, it sounds so obvious now in the midst of a pandemic, but the reality is that there's always something new around the corner. There's always something new to learn in infectious disease, and there are always going to be challenges for us to solve. And I think it's that that keeps me on my toes. Um, and keeps me thinking that uh, really excites me about a, a lifelong career in infectious disease and epidemiology. Um, so um, with that, um, I do have just a couple of cases and a little bit about um, patient safety um, in general and what I've what I do, what work looks like in healthcare epi. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions about the journey first, or if you want me to just go right into the cases. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a couple of good questions here. So yeah. okay. you may have heard, but infectious disease has kind of been in the news lately. <laughs> um, so we've seen a lot of change. You know, we had a vaccine published in less than a year, <clears throat> had so much research attributed towards the coronavirus. How does that differ? You know, everyone's focusing on one specific virus. How does that look different than when you were doing your training? Uh, like for example, for this bacteria that was spreading through the hospital. How does kind of the difference in collaboration and teamwork look in that situation? Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. And um, in fact, that's such a great question because a lot of um, a lot of the themes of the case, a couple of cases I have, um, really have a lot to do with collaboration and, and teamwork because I think that's essential in epidemiology. Um, <clears throat> we uh, this it sounds like it's off topic, but I'm going to get to answering your question. Um, one of the bright spots of my day, I also, with our first and second year med students um, of my week, uh, is a class on humanism in medicine. And our last class last Wednesday was the opportunity to sit down with a small group of us and reflect on awe and beauty in medicine. And the thing that, um, you know, what, what's great about that class is that could mean anything to anybody. But for me at this moment in time, that really just meant how we've come together from a science perspective and um, been able to learn so much and accomplish so much as it relates to COVID uh, together. And, um, you know, I've seen over my career, <clears throat> when I very first chose this path, it felt very niche. Um, there were not a lot of people doing um, healthcare epidemiology and infection prevention. And in fact, um, so niche, and this sounds so cliche, but it was absolutely true. Um, when I first joined, I was joining a one other person team in our entire hospital, um, caring for thousands of patients. Uh, and our small team, um, of one other doctor, one nurse, and one technologist um, <clears throat> was literally in an office in the basement that was separated from other people. Um, literally something that, you know, we didn't get invited to meetings and, and it wasn't just a prevalent thing to talk about. And in my short career, I haven't been around for that long. In my short career, I've seen that even before COVID completely change as we start to realize that um, a lot of these infections are preventable. 
Um, and there is a lot of opportunity. And so the first step of that is just being armed with the knowledge of what we're facing. And that's where I think a lot of the data points come in from epidemiology. And we now are a team of um, six physicians um, and 12 nurses and technologists plus informational specialists. And we are at the top of every agenda at every meeting in the hospital and something that folks are really talking about and a valued resource. And, and I think, you know, one of our favorite things to say is while we've grown and that's fabulous, we can be a resource to people our team is not infection prevention because infection prevention happens at the bedside um, with the patient. Um, and so really everybody's job is infection prevention. We're just here as the resources for the healthcare providers to help enact that um, and to give them the tools they need to really understand the healthcare epidemiology. So collaboration key. So long answer to your question, but I loved it. No, that's a great answer. I, I'm really <coughs> interested by that humanist um, Human, humanism in medicine class you mentioned. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Is that with um, physicians or med students or both? Yeah. What does that look like? Yeah. So um, at the University of Maryland, we have um, a few courses that are elective opportunities for students to explore a little bit more um, in the pre-clerkship setting. Um, other examples would be medical Spanish, um, primary care track, social justice track. Um, and humanism is one of those. And in that course, this course was actually born um, from students who were looking for an opportunity to come together before they started um, on their clinical rotations heavily and really think about topics embedded in medicine in a thoughtful way um, to just have as a group. And so we have three um, we have three things that we try to achieve in, um, in this course. And it's a group of about 25 students. Um, there are four student leaders who run and organize the course and some faculty advisors such as myself. And then each session has some faculty invited to it. And we have 16 sessions that are small group discussion-based sessions that um, we talk about topics. So beauty and medicine is one of them. Um, death and dying was one that we had recently. Um, uh, gender in medicine, um, racism in medicine, um, how to uh, how to navigate a um, a patient encounter that might be difficult um, is another one. So, uh, and we also have some sessions that we collaborate with the um, museum, the Baltimore Museum of Art, uh, to really look at um, how art intersects with medicine and other humanities. Um, and so the core of the class is those discussion-based um, faculty and students together coming together to talk about these things. Um, also, as part of that, um, students engage in a, in a project, um, an individualized project that brings them joy. Um, so it could be, you know, we've had students create a cookbook, we've had students put on a, um, a a dance or musical performance. We've had students do uh, visual arts like painting or photography, uh, and we have a banquet to celebrate that. Um, and then the third aspect of the course, which we haven't been able to implement as much this year, unfortunately, is really just becoming a part of the Baltimore community. And that's made up of electives, just exploring the community together. Um, students have gone on field trips to museums, to a park, um, they've done service uh, together in different community organizations. But um, so really the goal of the class is just to, um, it, to practice being a humanistic physician. That sounds like a really amazing way to incorporate something different into a medical school curriculum that probably gives these students a lot of useful tools to use during their time in the clinic once they graduate. Now, I'd, I'd like to go back to the to what sparked your interest in research, that bacteria that you guys didn't have an antibiotic for basically. Mm -hmm. um, so what led you to, to dig back into that arsenal and, and use an antibiotic that hadn't been used in decades? And how did that translate into the clinical setting? Did it work? And, and how did that um, propel your research forward? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was probably people smarter than me at the time um, that recognized this could be a, uh, a useful tool. 
Uh, but it's a pattern that we've taken on in infectious disease over and over again. Um, you know, we are fortunate to have a lot of the science on our side and, and know um, a lot about the antibiotics that have been developed. And, and the way we typically look at antibiotics are, you know, each antibiotic has a mechanism of how it works, which leads to um, almost kind of a list or a menu of bacteria that it might be effective against um, if resistance isn't a problem. And then we, of course, through experience, know about side effects. Um, and so, you know, literally what people did was, okay, I'm looking at this particular strain of Acinetobacter and it's resistant to all the commonly used antibiotics we know now. What what other antibiotics that are we not using in practice but are available um, might it have effect, uh, might be effective against? And you can test that in the lab and see, yep, it is effective. Uh, but just like every single decision we make in medicine, whether we realize it or not, um, we're doing a risk benefit calculation, right? So, okay, so this antibiotic looks like it's effective in the lab. Um, historically, we have some case reports where we've treated patients and it seems to have done the job, um, but we also know about this side effects. So, you know, is it worth it? And um, while the side effects were severe, including um, this kidney failure um, and um, some neurologic side effects, um, we had patients dying of this infection. And so if we really had no other choices, it became um, an easier calculus to make and to still try to utilize that antibiotic. Um, and, you know, going, going on the more uplifting side of, you know, this kind of goes along with um, where we were at with coronavirus and how much we've learned so far. I did my fellowship um, in 2001 to 2005. Um, so that was kind of the peak of the time uh, that we were doing that. And at this point in time, we've probably had almost, I don't know, maybe five or six novel, not just new, but novel, like two completely different mechanism um, antibiotics developed. And so we still are using these really older toxic medications in, in niche populations if we don't have anything else. Um, but we've broadened that arsenal in this short amount of time, which um, which really was amazing. Um, uh, and then you asked me a second part, and I've forgotten. That's all right. Um, so <laughs> I was wondering, <laughs> I was wondering, you you mentioned before that you had no idea that you would have ended up in in uh, infectious disease, and you grew up kind of knowing you wanted to be a physician, but you kind of landed in this position um, through experiences, through your residency and whatnot. Now, did you know that you wanted to go into academic medicine or is yeah. that also something that you found out along the route and what led you to make this decision? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I didn't know. Um, I didn't know I wanted to do academic medicine and I don't even think I knew what academic medicine was um, until I really got, I'm still learning what academic medicine is maybe, but, um, uh, but during my fellowship, um, I, in part, it's possible that I made the decision to go into academic medicine because I didn't have a lot of other experiences, um, right? So we train in academic medicine in medical school, we train in academic centers in residency and fellowship. Um, and that's, so that's all I ever knew. Um, I don't regret my decision to go in academic medicine. I think it was a perfect choice for me, but I will acknowledge that it's possible that a large part of coming to that decision was the fact that that's where I felt the most comfortable because that's where I've always been. Um, definitely what I love about it now um, is that, um, it, is that there are so many components of it and I'm able to, um, I'm almost able to do something different every day. Um, you know, whether it's my research, whether it's um, part of hospital committees on, you know, hospital up and patient safety, whether it's teaching um, or my patient care, obviously. Um, and yet, although I'm able to in, be engaged in all these different activities, I'm also able to tie them all together um, with a common theme. Um, which is fabulous and a theme that I love um, and I'm passionate about. Um, and, 
And it also offers quite a, um, ironically, quite a flexible lifestyle as well. And so when I am seeing patients, um, my days are a little bit more rigid because I am 100% dedicated to patient care. Um, but I don't see patients every single day because I'm doing some of these other aspects. Um, and of course, you know, that allows me to explore things in a different way. Just the way my day is structured is a little bit more flexible as well. Um, and that's been good for me personally um, and good for my family. Um, and then I think the thing I love the most about, um, about the academic center, or at least the one I'm at, is the people. Um, the patients that I get to care for, I get to interact and work with um, amazing hospital staff. I have faculty um, that are um, also academically minded and very interested in talking about um, and learning uh, and the students and trainees that I interact with on a regular basis. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. Thank you. Because I think a lot of us understand a little bit what a clinical life looks like, either through patient being a patient or through shadowing other physicians. But academic medicine is something you can't really, you know, you, you can't really see it without your perspective here. So thank you for that. Yeah. Now, if you'd like to go ahead and start presenting the, the patient scenarios. Sure. Thanks. Um, so I have a lot of slides, um, but I'm going to skip through some of them because I wasn't sure what we were going to get to um, with this conversation. Um, this is uh, maybe a little bit of um, just giving some insight into these hospital acquired uh, infections and um, patient safety overall. And um, this slide is, a, is just an interesting graphic to just talk about the fact that, you know, um, errors happen in medicine. Um, and in some cases, preventable errors happen in medicine. And it's important to be able to talk about these so that we can recognize where errors occur so that we can make some changes. Um, and uh, this sort of just gives you a graphic of, of how often errors, um, errors come into play. And in fact, uh, in a few years back in the British Medical Journal, they, a group of authors looked at the most common causes of mortality in the US. And when they looked at medical error, um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more in depth about what that is, um, it was the third most common cause of death in the US, right? We're all used to hearing things like heart disease and cancer, um, but medical errors were a bit of surprise when we looked at the data in that way. Um, and as we talk about how to make uh, environments um, safer, um, these are just some of the themes that, uh, that come up frequently. And some of the ones that you guys have brought up already, communication, teamwork, collaboration, um, professionalists, uh, professionalism, being mindful of the data uh, and being transparent about what the data is. Um, let's see, I, I think I'll start with this case. This is just a really quick one. And then uh, we'll go into a second one that um, I think might be interesting as well. Um, so in this case, um, this is a intern. Um, so let's see, fast forward in your careers, this would be like the year after medical school. Um, you're a doctor now, uh, but you're still a trainee. You've got a lot of people on your team kind of working together to take care of patients and you're still learning. And you're in the hospital, you're in an overnight call. And when you work overnight, you are caring for patients that you're used to caring for during the day, um, but also patients that um, may be on somebody else's team. Um, so you're, you're kind of sharing in that load. So people get to sleep eventually too. Um, and as part of that, you were in the emergency room and uh, seeing a patient, but a nurse on the floor calls you at 2 a.m. Um, and this is uh, what the nurse said. Um, Dr. Monero, my name is Stephanie. I'm taking care of a patient, Mr. Gibb. His temperature is 103.5. Um, I think most of you guys um, are familiar with your own temperatures to know that this is pretty high. Um, what would you like me to do? And um, I'll, I'll pause there and reflect. I know you guys haven't done any medicine yet, um, but you've probably done a little bit of shadowing. And I think 
you know, interestingly, as an intern, this is kind of the first time you're out there. So just, um, you don't have to answer, but just want you to think you get this call and you're still learning. Um, and, you know, what about this scenario, I guess, just what are some of your initial insights and feelings? I just want you to dig deep. Again, you don't have to answer just, would you be nervous? Would you be anxious? Um, would you be distracted because you're in the ER at two o'clock in the morning trying to do something else or fatigued or tired? Um, and then take another thought and think, take a step back and be a little bit more analytical and say, you know, do we have enough information here? What else, you know, what else, um, what else do we want to know? Um, this is a good first step, uh, perhaps, but is there enough information? Um, and so what Tony does is he's very organized and he's very um, systematic. And what the interns do when they're covering for each other is they provide a lot of information about each of the patients so that you don't have to think too much on your feet. You can refer to your sheet um, and say, okay, you know, here's, here's what I need to do. Um, so Tony refers to his sheet and um, from one of the other interns and he quickly looks for this patient, Mr. Gibb. And he finds uh, his information and what it says on the sheet is that Mr. Gibb is stable and there's nothing for Tony to do overnight. Um, and so he says, Stephanie, you know, I've looked and he looks okay, nothing to do at this time. Recheck his temperature and his vital signs in a few hours. Um, again, he was busy, he was in the emergency room, he goes back to doing admissions. Um, and in a few short hours, the um, primary team who's taking care of uh, Mr. Gibb comes in and notes that indeed Mr. Gibb had a fever all night long. Um, and now his blood pressure is a little low and his heart rate is a little high and he just doesn't look as well. And so he's starting to show um, signs of maybe that fever being a more serious concern or a serious infection. Um, this is a series of cases that uh, stem from real life cases that we do with an interprofessional group of people. So usually we'll, we'll bring nurses, doctors, pharmacists, technicians together to talk about cases like this. Um, and in this scenario, you guys had mentioned um, communication. And that was kind of one of the things that I, I wanted to highlight in here is what perhaps were some of the opportunities for better communication in this, um, in this example, and how might we um, have improved upon it? So I, I might just kind of go back to this and just pose this question to you guys, you know, what are some of the examples or areas of how we could communicate a little bit better? Um, one of the interns wrote something uh, that was kind of vague Mm -hmm. um, so that that was like a first line of communication that was kind of iffy right. um, and uh, the intern didn't really go communicate with the patient I guess to see how they were feeling um, mm -hmm. they kind of just took their temperature at face value and just thought everything was going to be okay absolutely I love that answer I mean, almost always if the nurse is calling you, um, you know, you know, unless it's a straightforward question, it's always a good idea to actually see the patient and, and decide. And that's something so easy to forget when you're in the, you're in the midst of seeing other patients, right? Um, so, you know, I, nobody is at fault for any of these things, but just areas of opportunity. Anything else that sticks out? We don't have to. Well, we never really know why he was even in the hospital for the first place. So like seeing a bit of a more in-depth patient history might help them understand like what's causing the fever. Right. And again, kind of going back to what we just said, if it's not on the sheet, then maybe go, you know, asking more questions of the nurse or going back in, um, going back in as well. Does anyone come from um, a nursing background or have experience in nurse or tech field? Um, so it's also fabulous to learn from each other. And that's why these interprofessional settings are really great so that you can kind of understand, you know, it's, it's this weird situation where we're expected to communicate, um, obviously, as part of the same team, and we're learning a whole different set of skills, right? Um, and so one of the things that we get to do in this session with, um, with the students is talk about this tool called the SBAR. 
Um, and it actually is just a framework of communication that ironically, um, the nurses in their training spend a lot of time talking about. And we spend very little time in medicine talking about the SBAR. So it's really this interesting dynamic of like, we're supposed to communicate together and one person's learning a tool that, that the other is, is like, we're almost speaking two different languages, right? Um, but as part of their tool, um, when they are communicating with somebody else um, and you picked up on some of these themes um, for every communication, it doesn't have to be long, but you should describe the situation. He has a temperature and I'm worried about him. The background, this is exactly what you guys wanted to know that we didn't get from this case. What is the background? Why is he here? Why, you know, what, um, what had been happening during the day that led up to this? Um, my assessment, um, you know, from the, from the nursing side, when she initiates that initial communication, Stephanie, you know, he hasn't had a fever since he's been here and he's a little diaphoretic, which means sweaty and I'm worried about him um, and a recommendation. I'd like you to come see him, um, right? So not to put this all on the nurse because I think you guys highlighted some of the things that the physician could do, but you can see how you could really utilize that tool and there could have been more effective communication in, in both ways. Um, so I don't want to belabor that, but I think more talking about patient safety and preventing um, infections or hospital injuries, um, simple things um, like communicating with each other effectively are really important. Um, so what harms patients in the hospital? We talked about, you know, medical error, and these are the most common medical errors. And obviously my interest is in healthcare associated infections. And so that's, um, you know, where I'll start. Um, healthcare associated infections are a really big deal. Um, about almost 2 million people a year will acquire a healthcare associated infection. 5% um, of, of patients. So that means if you see 100 patients in your first, you know, in your first year of medical school through shadowing and clinical experiences, we'll, um, five of them will develop a hospital acquired infection. Um, and there is mortality associated with that. Um, almost 100,000 people die each year from these types of infections. Um, it causes an increased length of hospital stay and contributes to an overall increase in, um, in healthcare costs. And at the same time, 70% of these are thought to be preventable. And so there are a lot of different things that we can utilize uh, to prevent these infections. Um, just a very brief um, kind of why are um, hospitalized patients or patients associated with the healthcare system more at risk for infections? And there's a number of, um, of reasons. One, um, you know, we're seeing patients again at their most vulnerable. Um, they may be immune suppressed um, or severely ill in such a way that they're more vulnerable to infections. Um, and our specific bacteria like that acinetobacter um, preys on opportunity um, and looks for people, again, who are at their most, uh, most vulnerable. Um, there's a lot of things that happen in the hospital, close proximity to other people who also have infections um, and these extrinsic factors that also put us at greater risk. And I don't know if any of you guys have um, volunteered or shadowed in a critical care setting, um, maybe now the picture I'm about to show isn't going to be as shocking because of some of the images you've seen around COVID, but you know this could be a typical critical care patient. And what you see when you start to zoom in is a lot of devices associated with the patient. And if you remember from some of your bio classes, um, the skin is the largest organ and it's the first line of defense against many of these infections. And you can see just by looking at these images that we're breaking that first line of defense. And here's another opportunity for bacteria to come in and get infected. Um, and bacteria particularly like this plastic or foreign material, they hang on to it and it's hard to treat those infections. And that's in fact what we call biofilm. Um, and um, in the hospital setting, a lot of these healthcare associated infections can get transmitted from one person to the other. Um, you know, we think about infections, um, you know, early on, we didn't really know how COVID spread. And, um, you know, we were thinking about in the gym, we have to clean off the equipment so that if there's any contact between one person or another, 
um, we could spread it in that way. And in fact, in, in the hospital setting, it often is this indirect spread. And us as healthcare workers, our hands, our stethoscopes are one of the main ways that it gets from patient in one room to patient in the other room. So there's a lot that we can do to break that cycle and prevent um, infection. Uh, and these are the types of infections that we generally see. Um, surgical site infections after surgery, pneumonia, particularly patients who are very ill or critically ill, um, urinary tract infections and bloodstream infections. Um, and in the very short time, um, I'm gonna skip this, this next case um, because I wanted to talk about um, a last case that kind of brings together some of the themes that we were talking about. This is something um, I did with another infectious disease professor, Dr. Manjari Joshi, um, who works at Shock Trauma Center. Um, and we collaborated um, in, this, uh, in this case together. Uh, her role actually in this setting was the primary physician and my role was more um, from the systemic systemic approach of um, hospital epidemiology. So she was caring for a 28 year old patient who had recently had a liposuction procedure in an outpatient setting. And within very short time of that outpatient liposuction procedure, this patient developed very high fevers, incisional pain, so right where the um, surgical incision was. Uh, it was red, it was gray, discharge coming from the abdomen all of which you can imagine is not normal, and reported to a community um, emergency room. And that emergency room, um, that emergency room um, physician noted that, um, uh, that this was beyond usual. So they called shock trauma and had them transferred um, by air. And when the patient came in, they were very sick. They had went into systemic uh, infection, they were in shock, their kidneys were shut down and their wound was um, very infected. Um, do I, should I, should I pause and just do some questions or do you guys um, wanna do the rest of this case? I think this case is interesting. So I'd like to- Okay, okay. I just wanna make sure time-wise we're okay. So um, it's not long, um, it's not long, so. Uh, so when they arrived, um, they were actively resuscitated. And I just want to give you a, shot, uh, a opportunity to see um, what um, resuscitation looks like in a shock trauma setting, which I don't do, but I am fortunate enough to have observed. Um, so the patient, as mentioned, was airlifted. They land on the roof um, and the healthcare team meets them up, at the, um, up on the roof where the helicopter lands. Um, I, had, I had another picture of the initial resuscitation, but I lost it. Um, and then they come down into the, um, into the trauma bay, and then there is a team, a huge team of people that come together uh, and are assessing the patient from multiple angles all at once. Um, so while they were in the hospital, um, they actually had to go into the operating room multiple times to kind of clean out this infection that they were having in the surgical area, the original area of the liposuction. Um, their kidneys failed, so they were placed on uh, dialysis. Um, they needed breathing support, so they were on a mechanical ventilator for 14 days. Um, and they had multiple other complications like a blood clot or pulmonary embolism and bleeding from the gut while they were there. Uh, in total, they stayed in the ICU for 38 days and 77 days in the hospital and 45 additional days in rehabilitation. So this was a very severe um, case. Um, teams involved, um, you can see, you know, we talked about collaboration and how people have to come together. Uh, teams involved here were incredible. Um, and the reason why I wanted to bring up this case though is, is this, um, it turned out that this infection, um, the particular organism that they grew when they went into the operating room the first time um, when they presented to shock trauma, they were able to culture some of the material there and look in the microbiology lab and see the organism. And the organism they ended up identifying is called group A streptococcus. It's not a terribly uncommon organism. Um, 
it is a pretty uncommon organism, I guess I should say. We have lots of case reports of it, but usually when it occurs, it's a sign of something bigger. Um, and so although it was only one case, this infectious disease doctor, when they saw that report and saw how severe the infection was and how it happened at, right after the liposuction, thought, I'm worried about maybe some contamination in this outpatient setting, um, in this outpatient surgical arena, and I think we need to talk to more people. Um, so she called our team in infection prevention, and we said, we agree, this is really weird. Um, you know, we don't see these cases too often, and because they had just had this procedure, we really need to um, know more. So um, <clears throat> I have mentioned a little bit about what our infection pre prevention team looks like, and here we are again, doctors, nurses, med techs, and in fact, um, information technologists with experience and expertise in epidemiology. Um, we came together, we called the health department. This case actually was in the news um, and it was uh, also a case report. So you may have heard of it. Um, we called the health department and come to find out that they did a little bit digging and investigating and three other, um, two other patients in the region um, had presented to other hospitals with severe invasive group A strep infection. And they dug a little bit deeper and found out that they had all received the same procedure at a medical specialty, uh, medical spa facility. Um, and <clears throat> this in fact has been reported in the literature before. Um, so liposuction, in case you're not familiar with it, it's a pretty simple outpatient procedure, excess removal of fat. Um, but some of these more um, niche areas may not be regulated by the state health department. Um, complications are pretty rare. We very rarely see complications of this. Um, group A strep as an organism is a bacteria that is, um, can be found as a normal colonizer, um, something that symbiotically lives in patients' throat or skin, but very rarely causes infection. Um, and when we do, we're, we need to be wondering where that came from. Um, healthcare workers um, could also be colonized with it. And in the operating room setting, that could be transmitted from a colonized healthcare worker on their hands or through their um, respiratory secretions uh, into the wound causing infections. And those infections can be anywhere from mild to what we saw in this case, which was life-threatening. And you can see um, a high mortality rate. Um, <clears throat> so once we recognized um, that that was what was going on in this case, um, the health department was able to really take a much broader investigative look and look to go in and see what the operations were. Um, they were able to reach out to other patients to see who might be at risk, um, to ask survey questions, to assess the environment. And what they did, obviously, was they stopped um, surgeries at that center until they figured out uh, a way to do it much more safely. Um, th three of the total cases, one died. There was a fourth case that went to the emergency room. And you can see <clears throat> Their, um, their characteristics here. Um, it turned out that uh, they were able to also look at the microbial genetics and show that the organisms were all related to each other, suggesting it came from a common source. So again, perhaps a contaminated healthcare worker. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, they, needed, they closed the facility initially um, had effective communication, which is a key aspect of that, and implemented some further um, prevention mechanisms to reduce transmission of this organism. And I think just the important valuable lesson to come back to this, um, you know, what's listed here, that first piece recognition, that was one savvy doctor just recognizing that something wasn't normal um, and taking the initiative to contact somebody else and say, hey, this doesn't seem right. Should we investigate this a little bit more? And that led to amazing communication, effective teamwork, working together, um, and the ultimate goal of, um, you know, unfortunately, there was, there was clearly an unfortunate outcome. One of those patients died, um, but the many of lives that were probably saved by that quick action of being able to shut down and reverse course. 
Um, and so I really just wanted to end on that. Just teamwork um, is huge in all of medicine, uh, but in infection prevention, um, it is uh, critical. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, I know we're kind of at time, but if you have any last minute no, questions, was, I'm happy to answer. That was a fascinating story. Um, I, I, I knew that infections are prevalent in hospitals. I did not know how prevalent they were. So those numbers were really shocking. Now, as an infectious disease physician, you said 70% of these um, hospital acquired infections are preventable. How, what drastic measures need to be taken to prevent these? Or is, is it drastic at all? Or is it as simple as like washing hands more often, sanitizing surfaces? Like how preventable are, are yeah. we talking about? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think we've come a long way um, and I'm looking forward to having some studies that, um, that show, you know, with the measures that are in place now, how many more are preventable, um, because I think that that 70%, um, although it's not that long ago, I think with all the things we've implemented, um, you know, we've come a long way. Um, I think just being aware of what's preventable is key. Um, you mentioned washing your hands. So if there's something I'd suggest people doing in the, uh, in the hospital setting, it is washing your hands. One thing we didn't get a chance to talk about is a lot of those infections are related to those devices that we showed as a picture. Um, and so really here's where some novel things come in. I mean, one, one not so novel is really assessing whether or not your patients need those devices in the first place. Um, and assessing daily whether or not we can take those devices out. Um, but work with biomedical engineering teams. How can we make those devices more um, safe? Um, how can we utilize alternative devices that are more safe? Or how can we um, just get the devices out and be able to accomplish what we're trying to do in a different, in a different manner? Um, anticipating errors um, so that we know to look out for them, uh, report them when they happen so that we can always get better. Um, and being an advocate for your patients, so standing up when you see things are kind of not going the way that, um, that they should or where there's better opportunities um, are just some simple things. I mean, I could probably go on and on forever, um, but those are some simple things. Keeping right, yourself right. healthy is another thing I'd add to that. Right. It's, it sounds like there's just some really simple steps to, to make a huge improvement in patient outcome. Yeah. Now, one thing I'd like to touch on here, as you said, anticipate errors and know how to report them. And I know you mentioned this a little bit earlier about admitting when errors are made. With the case of this female who had the liposuction, it, was there any way for the, because I think I saw that all four cases were tied to the same doctor and same nurse. Was there any way for them to notice before the patient went to the ER, either during the surgery in the clinical setting, anything that might that might trigger them to anticipate an infection? Like, do you think they they did anything negligent here in this case? Yeah, no, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, unfortunately, if you happen to be an unlucky person who is colonized with a bacteria such as this, it probably means that you're healthy and normal and would have no idea that you're colonized, right? Um, so what you can do is adhere um, to standard infection prevention practices. Um, that's the hand washing, that's the sterile technique. And I'm not saying that they didn't do that, um, but the closer they adhere to that, the more they get to prevent those infections. Um, I think in retrospect, once you are able to see that it might be tied to a healthcare worker, there are some things that we could do additionally as far as like decolonization and trying to clear those infections. Um, I don't think that they actually ever found anything negligent, although in most cases, um, as did occur here, they definitely found some opportunities um, and they were able to make those changes and then have things be a bit more safe um, going forward. Well, that's promising that they weren't negligent. And, and thankfully, we had that doctor who recognized the GAS as, as a deeper rooted issue. Now, before we close out here, I want to know, how do you see this pandemic affecting everyone's views of infectious disease and sterile technique, cleaning processes? Like, What do you see as the future for infectious disease after going through this enormous yeah. pandemic? Yeah, um, it's fascinating. And it may be too soon to tell. 
I think very early on, um, people, uh, my knowledge was very sought after. Um, and then pretty short, I mean, you know, washing your hands and following sterile technique are not rocket science. So pretty quickly, my fabulously smart um, and intelligent uh, um, colleagues outgrew my, you know, or at least matched my knowledge of those areas. And they, they became experts themselves, which is fabulous. That is the goal. And that's what we want folks to do. Um, but I can tell you now, you know, just like just like all things, we're starting to see some fatigue. Um, hand washing rates skyrocketed, and now are starting to slow down um, amongst healthcare workers. And seeing a little bit more laxity um, slip in as far as infection prevention. And so I think we just need to continue to not only stay vigilant, but look for outside the box ideas. Um, I had it on one of the slides, but I didn't stop to define human factors. Um, human factors are ways that we as humans um, interact and optimize our environment. Um, so are there things that we can do, right? If, if wearing the personal protective equipment is a burden, um, how do we optimize our interactions with our environment in a way that makes it easier for us to comply um, and still be safe, right? And this is where we have to go back to thinking about our um, engineering colleagues and our basic scientists to really help continue to drive and seek knowledge in that area um, so that we can make these improvements for healthcare workers to stay safe. That's great. Well, those are great answers now. I have a couple more questions here, if you don't mind, if you have time. Sure. So since this is being pre-recorded, we typically take questions from the audience live, but since it was pre-recorded, we took some ahead of time from our audiences. Now, one of our viewers, Sydney Collins, asked what, you, you mentioned earlier that you, you kind of see patients some days, you don't see other days, you have a varied um, work schedule. So you might not be able to give us a typical day, but, but what would maybe a typical week look like for you? What is the balance between research, patient interaction, teaching? What does that look like for you? Sure. Um, so the way I um, have my patient care service is that I mostly um, see patients in an in inpatient consult um, arena. And so it's best to do that at chunks of time so that I really kind of can follow a patient who's been admitted to the hospital. Um, so I do that in like two week blocks. Um, every couple of months, I'll do a two week block where I'm seeing patients. And when I do that, I'm almost always committed to seeing patients for most of the day. Um, then, you know, other folks who do things a little bit differently, somebody who is maybe also an infectious disease doctor, but specializes in HIV care, which is predominantly outpatient setting, um, has a much different approach. They may have one or two clinics a week where they are consistently seeing patients every week, but just, you know, in those dedicated hours or time. Um, so for me, when I'm not seeing patients, my day can be anything from um, you know, meetings with executives in the hospital to talk about policy, uh, walking around on the units to educate staff on um, infection prevention methods, um, going to um, meetings to share data in infection prevention with clinical teams, um, teaching. I didn't even talk about that aspect of my career, but I'm more and more involved with just the daily life of medical students, helping support them throughout the four years of medical school um, and teaching. And then I also have a whole team of folks that I do research with. So I'm um, having a research meeting, um, going out into the wards and doing primary data collection. Any of that could be in my day and sometimes all of that, um, depending on the hour. Sounds like a very interesting and varied career with a bunch of moving parts. Uh, now, final question here, we ask this to all our presenters. If looking back on your time through medicine, training, education, what advice do you have for yourself when you were an undergrad looking into going to medical school? What, what kind of advice would you give yourself? Um, I think early on, um, I would have tried to give myself a little bit more confidence um, and specifically in the area of um, trying to seek out my own opportunities. Um, I think I came from the, an ilk of um, really trying to do things on my own um, and 
that translated into not asking for help, but it also, I had a wide view of what it meant to ask for help. Um, and I think even going to somebody and just asking, you know, do you have an opportunity to work in your lab or is there an opportunity to shadow you? Those were things that I, I was maybe a little bit more hesitant to do. And I think in retrospect, missed out on some opportunities. Um, and in particular, I think that happened in, in medical school um, that there were so many resources and opportunities available to me that I just didn't utilize. Um, so that, that's where I would give myself a little bit more confidence to reach out. And even, even if all I did through those interactions was get to know more people, that would have been a, a great value. Um, um, thank you so much for those words. I feel like a lot of us are like either too shy or too stoic to, to ask for help or, you know, look for different things. Um, I want to thank you so much for taking time out and for this amazing presentation. Um, I learned a lot. I'm sure that our audience is going to get a lot from this. Um, just some announcements before we sign off. Uh, we're going to send out the form. Um, make sure to take time and reflect on those journal entries. So you're going to get the most out of Dr. Thom's presentation. She went through a lot today. So really try to process that. Um, it will be in our link tree and also posted on the YouTube live stream. Um, make sure to join us next week, Monday, March 8th at 3 p.m. 3 PM with Dr. Mary Claire Zest. Um, other than that, uh, thank you for coming out and uh, we appreciate you guys.